Well, our Bible reading today uh, is the last one in this series in Matthew. You'll find it in your uh, service sheets if you've printed them off uh, on the screen in front of you, or you can follow along in your Bibles at home. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. At that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he and those who were with him were hungry? How he entered the house of God and they ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for him or for those with him to eat, but only for the priests? Or haven't you read in the law that on Sabbath days the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath? And are innocent. But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Moving on from there, he entered their synagogue. There he saw a man who had a paralyzed hand. And in order to accuse him, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal? On the Sabbath. But he said to them, What man among you, if if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A man is worth far more than a sheep, so it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he told the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was restored as good as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You've got a sermon outline there uh, in your service sheets on the screen. Uh, Take notes as a way of thinking about what we're talking about. There's a, uh, a copy of the sermon at the top of this screen in a PDF version. You can print it out and reread it. There's a comment box at the foot of this webpage where you can put any comments, questions, queries, even disagreements, and uh, Neil and I will endeavour uh, to respond as quickly as we can. The identity of Jesus is clear. I'm at point one on the outline. Uh, Matthew has portrayed him as the one promised by God who'd roll back sin, restore God's approval in this world. Uh, Matthew has shown him at work, shown him preaching and teaching and healing. Uh, in this, we've seen his identity, haven't we? as the good doctor, the one who brings outsiders in, the downtrodden up, the one who has the authority to set the natural, the supernatural, a whole person right, the one who is God in the flesh. A God willing, you remember all those facets of his identity and what it means to follow this kind of man. Now the picture climaxed last week with an intimate revelation of the relationship, that vertical relationship that Jesus has with his father. The Father knows him. He knows the Father in a way that's unique. He reveals the Father in a way that's unique. He's the only access point to God the Father. He's the only one who can offer rest. Remember that invitation in verse 28 of chapter 11, rest to the weary, the broken, in the way that God intended, in the way that we were designed for. That's really important to grasp at this point because it leads into the next section As Matthew peels back another layer of Jesus' identity, confirming yet again that if humans want the rest that we yearn for and are designed for, then Jesus is the bloke we've got to deal with. Let me pray. Dear God, uh, it's great uh, every week uh, to take time out from our weekly schedule to meet with your people around your word, by your word, because of your word, through your word. Father, as we listen to your word, now please apply it to our hearts and minds, deepening our understanding and delight in the identity of Jesus, coming to him for that rest that we so desperately need. In Jesus' name, amen. The key connection right throughout this passage and to the section before is that idea of rest. I'm at point two on the outline. In Genesis 2, 1 to 3, which was one of the readings we had earlier today, God rested from his creative work on the seventh day. He set it aside, we learn there, as the day of rest. 
It has no end in Genesis. There's no evening, no morning. And so I think it symbolises the perfection of the created right order, the perfection of the purpose of creation, a rest with God as creator, as he made. Humans are designed to be at rest with God. We hear later in Genesis 3 that he would walk in the garden with them. Humans are designed to be at rest with God, which is living in line with his design, his creative intention. And God set aside that last day in the creative week as a memorial day, a unique day, to be a day of rest, one in seven, at the end to remember what God did on that day. Uh, It's a signpost day in the weekly timetable which points towards what God has made and his purpose, what he intended for humans, creation and himself. It's called the Sabbath day. That rest was lost in Genesis 3 in the fall, wasn't it? At that, that moment we decided in our hearts and in our actions that we knew better than God, that we knew better than God's good and great design that we could be God instead of God. The Bible calls that sin and it leads us to being removed from the presence of God, placed under his judgment along with the whole world. And God committed to restoring that rest in his statement to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. God committed to using Abraham's family to reverse the curse of restlessness and to return humans to blessing, to dwelling with him rightly. In order to do that, obviously God's got to deal with the thing that steals rest, sin, the attitude and action that all of us have that says, I am God and God is not. In that big scheme of God's commitment, Abraham's family, now grown to a nation called Israel, received their job as God's people in Exodus 19 and 20. They're given a job in line with the purpose and commitment of God. And within that job description, the idea of rest figures prominently. The job of God's people, when you look at Exodus 19 and 20, is to represent God to the world, to be his people in such a way that people will know God through them. To do that, God gives them the revelation of his character in the Ten Commandments, the revelation of the one who's already brought them out of slavery. And as he reveals his character to them, they will display that character as they obey him. So people will look at them and go, ah, that's what God is like. Ah, wow. And within that revelation there at commandment number four, Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, is the remembrance of rest as part of the purpose and nature and character of God and his good creation in humans. There's a symbol there, the Sabbath day, like is set aside in Genesis chapter 2, a road sign in all of history to who God is, the God who wants to rest with his creation, his image bearers. There's a road sign there, a symbol in all of history to what God has designed and committed to restoring. So as Jesus issues that invitation to rest in Matthew 11, 28, to all those people who are burdened by trying to be God instead of God, who are worn down by that restless hamster wheel we call life, when Jesus offers that invitation to rest, all of these historical signposts should be popping up in your mind, in the minds of his listeners and now his readers. Even more than that, as we move from Jesus' invitation to rest in Matthew 11, 28 into Matthew 12, 1, we should be expecting that there might be a revelation of what that looks like, how he's tied to that, and so it shouldn't surprise us in verse 1 of Matthew 12. At that time, Jesus passed through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick and eat some heads of grain. It's a rural one. It's one we're familiar with without the machinery. The disciples, we presume the 12, are walking through a grain field. Hungry, they pick some grain, they rub it and they eat the grain. It's the Sabbath day, the day set aside for rest. 
They're spotted and Jesus as their teacher is approached with an accusation. Look at verse 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. The Pharisees know their Bibles, their Old Testament, their law. They're sticklers. They're famous for striving to uphold the revelation that God has given. Their accusation is clear. These men are working on the day of rest. They've broken the law. Jesus, what are you going to do about it? You're responsible. Now, while what the disciples were doing was allowed at Deuteronomy 23, 25, when they were doing it was not allowed. It was the Sabbath day. A strict interpretation of God's revelation said that you shouldn't prepare food on the Sabbath. In the opinion of the Pharisees, the upholders of God's law, well, the disciples were harvesting, threshing, uh, baking and eating all in one. Amidst all these extra regulations that God's people had put in place, so they didn't even get close to breaking the law. The disciples were breaking God's law in the minds of these Pharisees, or at least the surrounding regulations. It's a serious accusation in that environment to bring against the teacher and his followers. Moreover, in his first great teaching block, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, you'll remember that Jesus had publicly stated in Matthew 5, 17 to 20, that he was the fulfilment of the law, that not one part of the law should disappear. Jesus' response is to turn these men back to the very thing they hold dear. The scriptures, I'm at point four on the outline, the Old Testament. Did you notice his method in verse three? Haven't you read? In verse five, haven't you read? In verse seven, if you had known. In each case, he quotes from the scriptures, these men are experts in upholding from the histories, from the law, from the prophets. The first example he turns to from verse three is one we've just read. The greatest king of God's people, David, is on the run. He's in desperate and hungry need with the men around him. On the Sabbath, he enters the house of God. He takes the bread that had been freshly baked for God himself as an offering to God and he eats. Can you find any condemnation of him for that act anywhere in the Scriptures? In the second example that's given in verse 5, As if human need, hunger was not enough. Jesus raises the very fact that the priests of God's people work every Sabbath in the temple. They offer sacrifices, they light fires, they serve God's people. Can you find any condemnation of these priests anywhere in Scripture? In both of those examples, the greater need exposes the reality of the Sabbath rest. Let me say that again. The greater need exposes the reality of the Sabbath rest. The rest day is about pointing towards the restoration of rest by God. In the case of David, his restoration was shown as he ate. In the case of the priests, their work enables the people of God to join together in sacrifice for sin, remembering their place as God's people and the restoration that God promises. It's a classic method of argument which establishes the heart of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is about rest, not rule-keeping, box-ticking behaviour. And Jesus argues from these small examples so that when the big reality is plonked in front of his listeners, they'll understand. He argues from the smaller to the biggest. And if those examples stand, then look at verse 6. But I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. David was great, but the son of David is greater. The priests were great. But the good doctor who's come to deal with sin is greater. The temple was a great symbol of the presence of God with his people. But God in the flesh is now standing in their midst. Do you see the logic? If David was not condemned, if the priests were not condemned for the way in which they displayed the heart of the rest day, then why would you condemn Jesus' 
who is everything these people pointed towards. In order to expose their shallowness in verse 7, Jesus then quotes from one of the prophets, Hosea, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you'd not have condemned the innocent. If these men had truly known their scriptures, known God, then they would have known that God himself is about mercy. And through his mercy, God is about knowing him as Father. That's rest. That's what God desires. That's what's expressed in the situation of David and the behaviour of the priests. This is what was not displayed by the Pharisees as they condemned the disciples. And so the conclusion then is an issue of identity. Look at verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. These men are worried about rules, box ticking, the appearance of what matters. And in doing so, they failed to recognise the truth of the Sabbath rest day, the reality of that symbol staring them in the face, talking and walking amongst them. In fact, they revealed their knowledge by displaying their ignorance. They did not know God and his plans. Jesus is everything that the Sabbath rest day was pointing towards. Remember that description under point two? He's the one God promised from Abraham's family who would and could deal with the thief who steals our rest with our sin. So Jesus is the one who can restore humans to what they're meant to be, at rest in the presence of God. And these men have missed that truth about Jesus. So they've missed the whole purpose of Sabbath, rest, and God's commitment. It's a sobering confrontation on one level, isn't it? I mean, what a warning about knowing your Bible and missing God. Now, I'm not saying, hear me carefully, I'm not saying that blissful ignorance of the Word of God is a better way to know God. What I am saying is that these men are an example of knowing their Bibles back to front but missing it as the revelation of the character of God and his plans. It's a wonderful interaction too, isn't it? An immense comfort. It reaffirms that Jesus is the one we must deal with if we want to have what God made us for, true rest. It's worth pointing out at this point, I'm at point five on the outline, that as Jesus states his identity as Lord of the Sabbath, he doesn't do it in a bragging manner, does he? He doesn't beat his chest. He remains humble, the Son of Man. Moreover, it doesn't delete the Sabbath from the records, from the revelation of God, or from human observance. Jesus immediately is shown observing the Sabbath in the way that it should be. Look at verse 9. Moving on from there, he entered their synagogue. And there he saw a man who had a paralysed hand. And in order to accuse him, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? It's obviously the Sabbath. Jesus has gone into their meeting place, the synagogue. There is a man there. His hand is shriveled. He's like the outsiders in Matthew 8, physically displaying the brokenness of this world damaged by sin in a particularly sharp way. The religious leaders, perhaps even the very same Pharisees that we have met, bring this man to Jesus. Their reaction to his identity is not about revelation, but now they want revenge. They're picking a fight. They ask a question. We're meant to see the connection with the repetition of the word lawful from verse 2. We're meant to see the explicit opposition to what Jesus has revealed. And the question is revealing in itself. Their concern is correct behaviour, which rules are kept, which boxes are ticked. Jesus answers them from an experience. (coughs) Verse 11, but he said to them, what man among you, if he had a sheep that fell into a pit on the Sabbath, wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? A man is worth far more than a sheep. 
So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. The scenario is clear. A man has a sheep, perhaps his only sheep. The sheep falls in a hole on the Sabbath. What would you do? You'd get it out. Here's an image bearer of God. Here is someone for whom rest is not real because of the effects of sin in this world. Here is someone who is in desperate need of rest. The rest that is restoration from the damage of this broken world. Here is someone who is vastly more valuable than a woolly beast because they bear the image of God. What would you do? The comparison and the contrast is so stark and clear. These men are so stark on rule keeping and box ticking that they've lost sight of the purpose of the Sabbath rest a day set aside to point towards the rest that only God can provide by dealing with our sin. It's a rest day that reeks of mercy and not their rules. It's a rest day that displays knowledge of God as he is and not a series of no's about what you can and can't do. It's a rest day that's found only in the good doctor, the son who knows the father uniquely. The Sabbath day is about good the good of restoration of those who bear the image of God. And so Jesus acts to restore the man. Look at verse 13. Then he told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out. It was restored as good as the other. You can't miss the contrast in verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. They are so keen to keep the law that they commit the sin of plotting the murder of the one who is the end point of the law, the only one who ever kept the law perfectly by revealing God as he truly is. The identity of Jesus is revealed in his activity. He's the one to whom the Sabbath rest day pointed, the one who brings rest, who offers rest by dealing with our sin. And that's what the Sabbath rest day looks like the doing good of restoration. I'm at point six on the outline. In many ways, Matthew, I think, places these events here in a way that shore up the identity of Jesus, which has already been established. These interactions are about identity, about Jesus' identity. He is the Sabbath rest we need, the restoration to God the Father that sin has damaged. And he shows this consistently and constantly as he marches towards that moment where he will take the judgment for our sin. For someone who was part of God's people, a Jew, a reader who is coming from that background at this moment, this is a moment of immense importance. Here is the rest that the people of God so deeply desire. For an outsider, someone who's been removed from the people of God or put on the margins or has never been part of the people of God, like Matthew, the author. Here is the answer to all the restlessness that we participate in. That endless hamster wheel we call life, where we constantly try to be God and all we ever do is rebel against God. The purpose of the Sabbath then is to point to Jesus as the one who brings the rest, symbolised by that one day off per week. It's only in Jesus that the rest we are made for, in right relationship with God, as humans living in this world under the rule of God's word, it's only in Jesus that what we are made for can be restored in us. It's only in Jesus that the thief of our rest, our very own sin, is dealt with as we're slowly coming to realise. The place of the Sabbath remains. I think there is still a place for the Sabbath in the lives of God's people. It's not a requirement for getting into God's people, for being set right with God as our Father. That is to fundamentally misunderstand the Sabbath right throughout the Bible. But it is a moment to display where such restoration is achieved for us. In Jesus, moreover, as we take this one day off each week to rest with God's people in enjoyment of life as it's designed to be, 
We are a people not only pointing to Jesus but pointing forward to the time when that rest will be eternity. And so the practice of the Sabbath is something we might need to think about. It's one day each week where we display the identity of Jesus most fully in our practice. We do something in our weekly schedule that displays the identity of who Jesus is, the rest giver, the restorer, the one who deals with sin so that we can be returned to the presence of God. This will mean a number of things across people's lives, but it must at least consider this, the importance of gathering together as God's people, the rest from our weekly occupation as a statement that we depend upon God as our Father, the enjoyment and pursuit of doing good to show the restoration that comes from Jesus alone. Now, wouldn't that be a good topic? for lunch today as you think about the rest we have in Jesus. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you that you are the rest giver even as we in our rebellion lose rest. Dear Father, thank you that in your Son we can come to you and receive the restoration of sins forgiven so that we can be restored to what we were designed. Father, thank you that in Jesus alone is the rest that you made us for, that he is the fulfilment of that road sign in history of the Sabbath day. Thank you that we can still practice the Sabbath day, not as a requirement or a law or a rule (coughs) to come into your presence, but as a display of everything that Jesus is. Father, thank you for rest. Amen.